Leavitt, Arkansas, this is Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray. Join with us now as Pastor Murray takes you on a book-by-book, chapter-by-chapter, line-by-line study of God's Word. Now, here is Pastor Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Praise God, we're ready to get back into our Father's Word. The two brothers, what an interesting study. Those brothers from Genesis chapter 25, that blessings were given to, and yes, even the New Testament backs them up, that they were both blessed. One, you might say basically for a negative sense, and one for a positive sense, Esau and Jacob. And we see Esau, as he was later his land named Edom. They don't know if it was because he was so red or because of the porridge that the red uh, meal that he partook of sold his birthright for. But we do know that on a deeper level, inasmuch as it is written in Romans chapter 9, that God hated him while he was even in his mother's womb, meaning from what that soul accomplished in the world it was on the deeper level. It would seem that he had this habit, Esau, of not caring a great deal for his kinship to Almighty God, with God being our kinsman redeemer that puts him in a bad light. I have no trouble at all understanding why atheism would ultimately become his major religion, and it is a religion, because he doesn't care for God. He rather cares for self. That was the story of Esau. They would both become great nations, it was told by our father, superpowers of the end times. And presto, in this generation, what are the two greatest superpowers of this age? Russia, the USSR, and the USA, the United States of America. Allies aligning with both, but those two strong nations, especially in the latter days, would play a great part. And inasmuch as we see this peace, peace, peace and the detente that goes on, we have covered those times in history in the last lecture. We covered the year 1917 and 18, where the king of Edom was burned in lime. And I call to your attention the... Um, Tsar and his wife, Alexandria, that their family was butchered. They were Christians indeed and were related very closely to the king line in Great Britain even at this time. They're from that lineage. The family was butchered and salted down in lime. Yes, our Father's word is very true. If you take the time to understand it to the point that you can understand the signs of even this time. We're going to go all the way back to Numbers as we begin this lecture, the book of Numbers in the Old Testament, to show you that even from the beginning, and as it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end, and there is nothing new under the sun. God doesn't pull too many fast changes on us because it's difficult for some to keep up. He makes it easy for us, and we thank Him for that. But we ask a word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's precious name, Jesus. Amen. I want you to open with me to Numbers chapter 24. We're going to follow this Edom. We're going to a prophecy in the 17th verse of that 24th chapter that pertains to, yes, even the end of this particular earth age. And it reads, I shall see him, but not now. In other words, this is future. This is Messiah. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob. That's the one brother. A star out of Jacob. And a scepter shall rise out of Israel. That nation Israel. Don't confuse it with the nation Judah in this study or you will not understand the migrations of the people and this great nation. 
and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Seth. Uh, I want you to remember that Moab, uh, Moab uh, by this time, being a son of Lot by his old elder daughter, had one of his sons had will ultimately turn to Molech worship, which is to say burning his own children. But this deliverer would come, and he would come from Jacob, through Jacob. Verse 18, and Edom, this is in the Hebrew tongue red, it's Esau, the brother to Jacob, shall be a possession. Seir, Seir, remember in the Hebrew tongue is Harry, which was one of Esau's names. His mountain shall also shall be a possession for his enemies, and Israel shall do valiantly. Are you ready? Do you know? Do you understand? What an exciting generation to live in as we see prophecies, as they come to light before our very eyes. 19. Out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion, and shall destroy him that remaineth uh, of the city. In other words, that one that would be the son of Esau, so to say, that would stay in that city. And we see then Jacob, the one brother, and we see Esau, the other. We'll be talking about a son of Esau in the next verse. Let's go on with it as the prophecy continues. And we're discussing the second advent. And when he looked on Amalek, he took up his parable and said, Amalek was the first of the nations, but his latter end shall be that he perish forever. Do you listen to this prophecy? It's from your father. And he looked on the Kenites. That's not Canaanite. And many confuse this word with Canaanite. This is Kenite. It means the sons of Cain. And took up his parable and said, Strong is thy dwelling place, and thou puttest thy nest in a rock. You hide in the most, uh, the, the strangest, that is to say, of places. Unfortunately, the Kenites try to hide among our brother Judah as well, causing our brother Judah a great deal of trouble. But they are still the sons of Cain. That's what the word means in the Hebrew tongue, Kenite. 22, nevertheless, the Kenite, now the manuscripts say, nevertheless, Cain shall be wasted until Asher shall carry thee away captive. And he took up his parable and said, alas, who shall live when God doeth this? Well, my friend, you are. You will be living at that time. Many of us will, let's put it that way. I may not be, and some of you may not, but there are people living, breathing in the flesh today that I truly believe with all my heart shall see these things come to pass. It is written. I'll never forget, as a young student of our Father's Word, when I was searching, and I took that beautiful Psalms 22. Ila, ila, lama, shabbatane to see Christ's words on the cross spoken there. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And to know in my heart that Christ had not had a bad moment, but that he was teaching even as he was nailed to the cross. He was thinking of you as he taught that 22nd Psalm. And that 22nd Psalm continues on to tell who would crucify him, how it would come to pass, exactly how he would be nailed to the cross, and even down to the Roman soldiers gambling at his feet. And then as a young student to know that exactly as it is written in the exact length of years, presto, it came to pass as it was written. Therefore, I have no doubt that these prophecies will come to pass as they are written. I believe our Father's word beyond any doubt, shadow of doubt. He is in control. Well, what does that really mean to me today? Well, number one, it means he's your father. He's your nearest of kin. Number two, learn from Esau. 
Esau had no respect whatsoever for his heritage, his lineage. And God hated that. Why? Because God created all souls. I don't care who your earthly mother or father is. Honor them. But all of us were created by the living God, and He is our Father, and He is your nearest kin, if you would have it so. And He doesn't like you to toy with that. He likes for you to respect that. For He loves you very much, but He expects that love in return. In this lecture, it will be impossible to go into all those things that transpire as these events that we're talking about come to pass. I think of the book of Ezekiel. I want to go there, Ezekiel 38. I could, in passing, as, as you're turning there, I could tell you about Daniel chapter 11, where again, the two brothers, the king of the north and the king of the south, Chapter 11, pick it up along about verse 21 in your study, which goes to the future. There is a time appointed that Antichrist shall have these two sit down at a table. I feel that time is, could even be as early as next year. It is at a time appointed as it is written in Daniel chapter 11. They will sit down at that table at a summit but neither of them shall take a stand. I mean, beloved, you can read today in that great book of Daniel. Um, I'm going to just turn there if I say the verse and to help you in the Hebrew just a little bit concerning those two kings, and it starts about verse 25 and verse 26. Yea, they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him, and his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. That's fighting within and without. And in the prior verse 25, neither one of them would make a strong stand. And what is happening here? You have to associate that then with the prophecies written in the book of Revelation. Where, what's happening there? We see from Revelation 13, from the entire world, the nations talking peace in coming together as we see the multi-headed, which simply means it is a political system. One world political system as it formulates. And then the system solidifies. And during that time, Antichrist comes. But as we have totally disarmed, and we shall, basically, it will come to that, then there will, we will be attacked from the north. It will be the battle of the brothers. That's why the battle of the brothers is important to you, Jacob and Esau. It will be between, between this nation, our allies, Russia, and their allies. You want to read about it? Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief I want you to underline the words, those two words, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal and prophesy against him. This comes from that land of, uh, of, uh, the, of uh, Edom that they would ultimately settle. In the Hebrew, the words translated into English in the Hebrew manuscripts are R-O-S-H, pronounced Rosh. Now, certain scholars even translate it Rush. Smith will call it to your attention. Strong's Concordance will call it to your attention. It's real easy to check me out. Are you that have a set of the manuscripts, you will see the Resh, the valve, and uh, so forth, you will have no difficulty recognizing Rosh. So what should it say? The chief prince of Rosh, which later the word in the beginning was by the Volga, Rush, R-U-S-S, -S, and then today becomes Russia. Let there be no doubt of the land we speak. 
Verse 3, And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince. Again, the same word, the chief is Meshach. Meshach, the, chief, the prince of um, Rosh, the prince of Meshach and Tubal. And I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth. And all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. What do horses always symbolize? Power, force. It doesn't matter what, in a modern army, horses are the power and the force of that specific army. Do you want to know how the nations will be aligned at that time? No different than they are today. The nations are in place, dear one, and the hour is late. These are his allies. Five, Persia. Do you know who Persia is today? It's Iran. Do you think that Iran will slip back into the western states, nations? Forget it. God's word states that Iran will be attached to Russia. Ethiopia. And Libya, with them, all of them, with shield and helmet. In other words, they will all be allies. Gomer, all his bands, the house of Tugumoro, of the house uh, of the north quarters, and all his bands, and many people with thee. That's to say, many people of the east with thee. You want to know which way Red China is going? Read it for yourself. Seven, be thou prepared and prepare for thyself thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee and be thou a guard unto them. After many days, when? After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years, Thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel. Mountains meaning nations, the nations of Israel, the Christian free nations of the world, which have been always waste. It was a wilderness. Look at this nation, a wilderness until a short 200 years ago or so. But it is brought forth out of the nations and they shall dwell safely, all of them. Do you know why? Because our wall is with us, and our wall is our Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father that protects us. I want to skip on, if I may, what will happen. He will say, oh, I'm going to go down and take a prize of the unwalled cities. You know, there's really only one nation that you can truly say has unwalled cities. I can remember in Korea, I can remember the walls in the Middle East. Show me a city there without walls. But in this great nation with the waving fields of grain and the interstates that travel from one state to another, as you see, a few checkpoints for this, that, or the other, but none to check credentials. That is to say as to why you're traveling. No permits to travel. No walls. Freedom and safety. Unless too many go to sleep and let it slip from us as we allow a cankerous communistic ulcer to farm in both Panama to a degree, but certainly in Nicaragua, Cuba. Wake up, friend. Okay, verse 14. Let's continue on with it in this 28th chapter of Ezekiel. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto God. You understand what it means when it says prophesy? What God is saying, this is what's going to happen. Say this to Russia. Thus saith the Lord God, In the day when my people of Israel dwelleth safely, shalt thou not know it? You know why he won't know it? Because they don't believe in God. 
I speak of the atheistic system, not the Russian people that are Christian because they pay a much higher price for being Christian than you do, friend. And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses and a great company and a mighty army, an overflowing army, you might say. Look at it today as missiles, if you like. Ships, aircraft carriers, the Barian Straits, you can even march across it, part of the front, but from the north it shall come. And thou, verse 16, and thou shalt come up against my people of Israel. Again, don't confuse this with Judah. The prophecy as to when Judah and Israel shall be joined back into one stick is in chapter 37, that prophecy of the dry bones. All right? And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud over the land, uh, as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days. That's the end times, friend. It shall be in those latter days, and I will bring thee against my land. Who's going to do this? God says, I will bring you against my land. My land, what? In God we trust. God bless America. One nation, indivisible, under God, with liberty and justice for all. Are you asleep? Or do you appreciate this great nation? That the heathen may know me. What was the purpose? God says, I will bring you because I want you heathen to know that I am God. You're a bunch of atheists. When I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. Picture the locust army of Joel in a prophetic sense as well. Picture all those that live and dwell and uh, even as Esau, so are his children, that do not believe necessarily that God exists. Therefore, they find atheism quite comfortable. And they only recognize the arm of force, that is to say the might of man. 17, thus saith the Lord God, art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time? Are you that same Esau? By my servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them. Esau, I made you a strong nation and I made Jacob a strong nation. And the two of you are going to have it out. 18, and it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. Do you know what that means? God's anger comes up in his face, meaning God's wrath spews over. He is a patient, loving God. But when the wrath of God spills over, the end shall be, dear friend. You know, many do not understand that Judah and Israel split many, many, many years ago, even before the Babylonian community, or captivity, rather. Taken captive, Israel was from Samaria by the Assyrians. They migrated over the Caucasus Mountains and were later called Caucasians. Scythians many other names as they went north to Europe, settled Europe. Where do you think they disappeared to? They didn't. God said, my children shall become as numerous as the stars of heaven and the sands of the sea. Where are they? Open your eyes and look. Open your eyes and behold. My friend, it was no accident that we purchased Alaska from Russia for seven million dollars. No. Don't call it Stuart's folly. Stuart had no choice. God is in control. It will be the burial ground. For they will not pass the border thereof. Listen to it. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. So that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth, and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. What does that mean, my presence? El Shamal, God is there. 
second advent, return, and the mountains shall be thrown down. Mountains are nations. It doesn't, God's not going to destroy uh, the mountains of all the world. All right, He placed them right there and He likes them there pretty well. And the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. Why? There shall not be left one stone standing in Jerusalem, even at that time. And that is where Judah resides, even at this time, but not Israel. 21. And I will call for a sword against him. Him who? Esau. Throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God, every man's sword shall be against his brother. The story of the two brothers. And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood, and I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him, an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Have you ever seen any pictures of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah? I'm talking about after the fact now, the charcoal pits. And you hear people say today, well, this is going to be an atomic bomb. Hey, God doesn't need an atomic bomb. And as I said in the last lecture, this place is to be inhabited. He's not going to poison it. These, as these stones are mentioned in the book of Revelation, they weigh a talent, and it's according to whose talent you're going by. It can be anywhere from 100 to 180 pounds each. Do you know what a 100-pound hailstone will do to, say, a flying vehicle? Think about it. Talk about hitting a brick wall. Verse 23. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself. What is God doing? He's magnifying himself by raining hailstones? You bet. They're atheists. They don't believe there is a God. If some super army defeated them there in a great valley of Alaska, they'd say, my, what an army. But there won't be any army involved. And I will be known in the eyes of, of many nations, and they shall know. Not maybe, no more atheist, friend, that I am the Lord, that I am Yahweh. They will know that he is God. Verse 39, Therefore thou son of man, prophesy against Gog, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach, Tubal, Rush. And I, note the I, now not some army, I will turn thee back and leave but the sixth part of thee and will cause thee to come up from the north parts and will bring thee up on the mountains of Israel. In other words, they are approaching the nations of Israel, the Christian free nations of the world. And I will smite thy bow out of thy left hand. Who's going to disarm them? I, that's God speaking, with hailstones weighing 120 pounds and will cause thine arrows to fall out of thy right hand. It will not be the United States of America or their army, because by then we will have been sucked into the one world peace system anyway. We wouldn't have any way of defending ourselves. Four, thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy bands and the people that is with thee. I will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort and the beast of the field to be devoured. Thou shalt fall upon the open field. He's not even going to touch one of our cities. Do you understand what an open field is? There's nothing built there. God will cook their goose before it even gets to the pot. Do you understand? For I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. When my father says something, dear one, you can write it in your book, for he has it written in his. Well, what, is, what good does that do? It lets those atheists know God lives. It lets those atheists know that all wisdom comes from Almighty God. And if you try to drive God from your country, then you lose all wisdom. But they will gain much wisdom in one stroke of our Father's pen. Six, and I will send a fire on Magog, and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles, they're on the coast, 
and they shall know that I am the Lord. Again, that's the purpose, so that they can accept him in salvation. Apparently, nothing else will make them bow their knee on the first day of the millennium. They've got to know he's real. He's got to show them the hard way, talking their language. Clubs, two befores, hailstones, seven. So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel. There'll be a lot of our old people falling on their knees praying at that time when they realize they've waited too late probably. And I will not let them pollute my holy name anymore. They're going to call me Yehovah. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Now there won't be any questions asked at that time. Is God real? The world shall know with a bang. Behold, it is come. And it is done. Saith the Lord God, this is the day whereof I have spoken. What day is he talking about? The Lord's day. Are you familiar with the two brothers? When you see Ethiopia, Persia, that is to say Iran, Libya, acting in the way they do, does it come as a big surprise to you, my friend? It was written long ago. There should be no surprises. As we see them move and jockey for position, even now in place for the one world system. Verse 9. And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth. I want you to mark this down right real good. Those Christian nations of the ten tribe Israel, Canada, America, the Americas, will be untouched, the cities are, for they go forth of the cities to do what? And shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both of the shields, the bucklers, bows, arrows, and so forth. They will be seven times doing this, which means what? The seventh time is the millennium. And there will be teaching through that millennium. And on that day, the day, the day God just swore, every knee shall bow to Yeshua. You know what they will call this place? I want to skip on down. We'll give the character generator a moment to get there. I want to skip down to verse 15 in closing. Do you know what they're going to call that place? I can, do not ask me to document it. I can only tell you that it is from my father. I have no right to teach it, so this is only my opinion. But I guarantee you it's a lot more than an opinion. It was given to me firsthand. This is a valley in Alaska where we border Russia. And the passengers, verse 15, and the passengers that pass through the land, when any seeth a man's bone, they shall set, they shall, then shall he set up a sign by it, till the buriers have buried it in the valley of Haman Gog. In the Hebrew tongue translates the multitude of Gog. And also the name of this city shall be called Hamona. Thus shall they cleanse the land. How precious our Father's word. Hey, Mona, the multitude. And thou son of man, thus saith the Lord God, speak unto every feathered fowl. In other words, come and feast yourself. As the cleansing takes place, understand at that moment what happens. The seventh trump sounds on the day God announced prior and all are changed instantly in the twinkle of an eye. But salvation will take place, yes, even through the millennium, for a very simple reason. There are many of those that call themselves atheists today, though they perhaps won't even know what atheism means, and they don't, have never heard it called by that name. But what we call it is a godless society. And the only sad part is that even in our nation whereby we call ourselves Christian, there is so little of our Father's Word taught in detail, chapter by chapter and line by line, 
that many that even call themselves Christians are not aware of what's about to fall on the world, the wrath of our Father. Will it hurt you? No. If you listen carefully, you noticed his wrath was only directed at his enemies. Are you his enemy or are you his friend? Which brother in a spiritual sense do you align with? Do you care about your heritage? Or are you one of those that God hates? Because God hates those that do not follow the heritage set forth in his word. For those that align within it have work to do even in this generation. Are you informed? The two brothers. Oh, we could spend a month here into details of current events. For prophecies come to pass in this generation as the labor pains grow shorter and shorter and shorter together, closer together, as we approach the birth of a new age, that it behooves one to keep up. So, watchmen, and that's what Christians are supposed to be, watch. But let me ask you a question as you set yourself out as a Christian watchman. What are you watching for? Do you know? You might say, well, well, I don't know. Well, then you're really not a watchman, are you? Blind faith is a wonderful thing. But faith upon the knowledge of the Word of God. When you are your weakest, you are your strongest, is to be informed. I hope you've enjoyed, and this will conclude the lectures on for this time at least, on the two brothers. Bless your hearts. Listen a moment, please. The book of Revelation, the word that means to reveal, to uncover in any language. What an inspiration to have it done chapter by chapter and verse by verse. That's what this series of tapes does, takes you through the book of Revelation with clarity. And it is amazing when we understand the words that our Father has given us and those things that we can expect covering subjects such as who are the two churches out of the seven that pleased Christ? All others failed. Who were those two? What does the throne of God actually look like in appearance compared to the throne of Satan? Chapter 6 will give you Satan's throne. Chapter 4 will give you our Father's throne. And that mark of the beast, understand with clarity from the 13th chapter. The book of Revelation, I know you'll enjoy it. free introductory package. Say, this is something we would like to offer for a one-time gift to all the new folk that study with us. This introductory package gives you a monthly newsletter, which means each month you will receive a newsletter with a Bible study on it. Hey, raising funds? No way. We're not beggars. We're Bible teachers. That's what it consists of. A tape catalog that will give you all the topics that are covered and the Mark of the Beast tape. What is this Mark of the Beast? Is it really on your forehead? No, Satan's considerably more intelligent than that. It's in your forehead, which is to say, in your mind. Have you been deceived? This is a free offer to you, one time to each new student. Say, find out what's really happening and what the story is on the Mark of the Beast. All right, bless your hearts, there we are back. Uh, we'll be showing you the 800 numbers here in just a moment. And after a prayer, this is that time. Do you have a problem? If you do there, as these many have requested special prayers here. Father knows he loves you very much. Do you know something? He, he wants you to ask him. If you have a, if you have a child and they're hurting, and you could help them. And when they come to you and they say, Dad, I need you, or Mother, I need you, what is your desire in parental love? It's to help them. Then do you think you are better than Lord God Almighty? 
that He is your parent, that He wants to reach down and help you. He is all powerful and in control, and you won't ask. So simple, what? Ask Him, won't you do that, Heavenly Father? We ask that with these special requests and those at home that you reach down, lead, guide, touch, heal in Jesus. Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. All right, let's get right into our questions here. Loreen from, Loreen, rather, from Texas. Where does it say God hated Esau in his mother's womb? Did he say Acts 9 or Romans 9? I didn't find it. You know, I thought last night when I was teaching, I thought, did I say Acts chapter 9? And, of course, that is. It's a copy from Malachi um, there. But it is Romans 9, certainly. And thank you, Doreen, uh, for calling that to my attention or for asking at least. Uh, sometimes, you know, I don't use cue cards and I don't use notes. I just simply go from the word itself. And you're going you're gonna to get a little of that if my mind gets to running too far ahead of this mouth. And I, it's, um, it's something, that's what we're a family and that's what we hold together for, is to keep things on balance. And it also goes to prove that we're not perfect, doesn't it? All right, thank you. I appreciate it. Isaac from California. What tongues and interpretations of tongues? I also didn't, don't understand what in a twinkling of an eye will be with Christ. Well, Isaac, I want you to make a note of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52. All right? That's where it happens at. It's on that day, the day, the day we were just talking about, the Lord's day, when we shed these flesh bodies and go into a new spiritual body that shall last an eternity. The word in the Greek, incorruptible, means a body that can't age, it can't wither, it can't um, be sick. Hey, you know, that's a good deal, all right? It's going to happen that quick at the sound of that last trump, the furthest one out. I'd learn, like to learn how to recognize the new age and what it's about. Can you tell me about it? Well... Isaac, probably to, the, to uh, an oversimplification would be any time that a group in any fashion or form tries to tell you that God is only the good that is within us. Let the red flag go up. Let the danger sign wave because they're following Esau. By that, I mean they don't care about their father. They think they are something else. They think they're little gods. I know that's an oversimplification and it would probably offend some that are in the New Age movement, but that's what's, that's what's wrong with you. You can't let God be God. You've got to let God be the good that's in you. Well, friend, if we had to let God be the best that's in these human beings, I would abandon ship right today. I wouldn't stick around to see the outcome. We have a living God and He is in control. Thank God for it. Isaac, that's, thanks for that question. What tongues and interpretation of tongues? I, I, I really, that doesn't make uh, a question, but I would assume that you're asking the tongues spoken on Pentecost Day in Acts chapter 2. There were people there with 50 to 100 languages. And when the cloven tongue, which means a tongue that goes in many directions, that tongue that shall be spoken when people are delivered up before Antichrist, they do not premeditate what they will say, but allow the Holy Spirit to speak through them, Matthew 24, Mark 13. That was a type. That's why Peter said, this is that that was promised by Joel. This is what he was talking about when that northern army comes. That helps you tie it together, doesn't it? And in the seventh verse of that Acts chapter 2, it said, every one of them heard clearly every word that was said. Not mumbo jumbo, friend. Not Babel, but God's truth. Now, Isaac, um, let us say that you could un only understand Spanish, and I can only speak English. The word was to be taken to the world. And Paul said, don't let, I'll use, I'll continue the analogy. It would be like, it would do me no good to go where you and others that spoke the same tongue you speak without an interpreter. You wouldn't know what I was saying from the Word of God. So, 
You take an interpreter with you. Okay, Cindy from California. In Daniel chapter 4, verse 23, could this apply to the end of the millennium? Also, when Satan is set free for a short season? Chapter 4, verse 23 is where... Uh, first, know that Nebuchadnezzar wrote the fourth chapter of Daniel. I know that surprises a lot of people, but he did. And the most beautiful prayer after his conversion. This has to do with his conversion. Inasmuch as they said, cut the tree down in the verse you speak of, 23, and let the stump, but leave the stump, brother. And let, was it four or seven times? It's four times pass over. It's seven, seven times pass over. And seven, of course, being the millennium. It could in that sense. Sue from California. I appreciate getting the 1611 King James so quickly. It's a challenge, but I'm enjoying it. Well, we've, I'll tell you, we've, you can appreciate Becky and Frank and the crew here in the office a great deal because I tell you, they worked themselves to death that week. And let's help them out again. What do you think? We do have the 1611 King James. I want to make it very clear. I do not recommend this as a study Bible, all right, for you to study today. But I do recommend it because it is the original translation. I had 5,000 of these printed up so that people, again, could have the original where they would have this letter that the translators of the King James wrote to the reader. That's you. Letting you know many things and many of their decisions. It has the uh, Apocrypha within it, even as the original did. In other words, you have a duplicate, a copy of the original. You'll have trouble reading it. Well, I just thought there was one good old King James. You got it. This is it. This was the first one. But it's good to know how important the thought, the object, the verb, which is to say the action, and how that language is do hold and can hold it. But for a gift of $25 to the chapel, uh, we have that original 1611. They've been out of print for a long time. I'm glad you received it in good shape. Naomi from Indiana, Mark 5, 25. What does 12 mean? Well, there was a lady that had an issue of blood for 12 years. 12, of course, is all, is, uh, it, it is, um, uh, Perfect government. Perfect government is what the numerical value of it is. But what did this insinuate? That lady was symbolic of Israel that had been, had, had been sick that 12 years that identified her, that Christ in bringing the message. Christ, God didn't lose the 10 tribes. They lost their own heritage. Larry from the Bahamas. If uh, one who truly believes in God, has experiences of fear in their life, may God continue, will God continue to bless? Um, well, that there's, um, um, that, that's human nature. When, when we were created, God put, the, what shall I say, the survive, uh, to, built within the human instinct for survival. That's what fear in that sense is. Don't ever apologize for um, I've been in many places, in combat and in other places, that fear was uh, right there. It's how you handle yourself while the fear is there. Never let it control you, but never apologize for having fear. James from California, would you please teach on how the Bible can be misconstrued? In, in Matthew, Jesus said that a young man had come close to committing the unpardonable sin. How does this correlate to what you teach, that it's not possible for the elect? No, you've, I quoted Matthew, thir Mark 13 where it says, if it were possible, even God's elect would be deceived. But at the same time, James, only God's elect could commit the unpardonable sin. Because when I mentioned just a moment concerning those tongues spoken of in Acts chapter 2, to refuse the Holy Spirit to speak through you when you were delivered up before the synagogue of Satan, Antichrist would be unforgivable if you knew better. Any sin and ignorance is no sin. But when you know better, and the elect will, 
Do I think it would be possible? No, I don't. Because God's elect hate Satan. There is no way they would bow to him at any price. When they see especially how he twists the minds of the people of this world and brainwashes them into believing fairy tales rather than the word of our Father, we hate him. Tim from California, do UFOs have good or bad? Is, if bad, please explain a little bit. You know, it seems like one question always brings up another. And I mentioned in the last evening, first off, they're not UFOs. UFOs means unidentified flying objects. In Ezekiel chapter 1, it states very clearly in the Hebrew that a highly polished bronze vehicle, circular in form, landed upon the earth and the ark of God was aboard it. Well, naturally, that would be a good one. But in Genesis chapter 6, we hear of the Nephilim, the fallen angels, coming to the earth and impregnating the daughters of Adam. If they were able to impregnate the daughters, there was substance to their body, of course, for Israel even ate, partook of manna, which is angels' food, the same food. In other words, not in spirit form, but physical form, to impregnate woman, they had to have transportation. There's no big deal that you see these things in Central America and other places with a, a higher level of knowledge, but they're not UFOs. They're not unidentified. God knows very well who they are. All in the world they are is a vehicle, whether it's, it's a car. Let's say it's a Ford or a Chevy. You can't say that a Ford or a Chevy is a good car. You could get a lemon or you could get a good one in either one of them. It's who's driving them that makes them a good or a bad car. All right, uh, Maisie from Blair, from Illinois, rather. The Moffat translation in Jeremiah 39, 9, 1, verse 22, the verses are rearranged. Is this correct? Dr. Moffat, and one of the reasons that I say that as a study Bible, everyone needs one, is the fact that many scriptures are out of alignment. Um, that's a study within itself, and Dr. Moffat was a scholar that brought a new translation out in the 30s, and he was almost branded a witch for it, quite frankly. And if the people at that time had known how much difference there is between this King James today and the original, they wouldn't have thought too much about Moffat. He's a good translation, and he's very accurate. I, there's only one or two places that I would find any fault at all with what he has done. That's a pretty good average. Kara May from California. When we are delivered up, is it all at once or one by one? Well, I'm sure it will be one by one. In other words, you, when you're having a trial, you, you uh, uh, will be tried singularly. It's, it's, don't think of it as like a jail trial, all right? It's simply your own relative saying, hey, Jesus. They're going to think he's Jesus. That's why he's called instead of Christ, which is what the Greek word anta means. They're going to think he's Jesus. And you're saying, it's not him, mama. It's not him, daddy. And they're going to go to him and say, oh, Jesus, Jesus, have mercy on my child. It's a good boy or a good girl, done good all their life. But they don't believe you're the Lord. Well, he's not, see. And then you're delivered up, and he's going to say, baby, 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 come here. Come, sit on daddy's knee. Haven't I brought peace to the world? Haven't I brought prosperity to everybody? Why do you resist me? I'm the Lord. You see, that's the kind of trial it will be, and that's why many people will be deceived. Because they think it's going to be blood, guts, and old glory. Well, it's not the way it is. It's the biggest revival and the biggest fake lover this world has ever seen. And he's on his way. The thing is, are you watching or do you know how to watch? And you are to allow and to speak at that time. Okay. Um, by the blood of the lamb proxy, would you please explain how these relate with anointing? Well, well it's, it's called intercession. There's, I, I don't have any objection to someone being anointed in proxy if, if the person, if it makes the person feel better. It's still the blood of the lamb that does the healing or curing. But when you can't be physically, say, 1,600 miles away, it does no harm. Greg from California, 
Matthew chapter 16, verse 27 and 28. Why would only some of them see him return? Okay, verse 27 and 28 states, Many of you that stand here shall see the kingdom of God as it comes. You'll, and it, he was speaking to who? His disciples. But don't, what does the word disciple mean? Students. It did not necessarily mean the twelve apostles is what I'm telling you. There, were, there could have been a hundred there of his students that studied with him. But they weren't all there when Christ returned. Only the twelve saw him uh, plus Mary Magdalene and others, okay? Only they saw him for when he came in his glorified body, that was it. Doug from Arizona, what's the chance of getting someone like you to run for president? Oh boy. I've got enough headaches already. We, we need a man such as Pastor Murray to help the country. We'll be sending ties. Well, God bless you. I appreciate that. You know, I really feel, Doug, that it would be stepping down for me to step from here into the office of presidency. I, I'm not, I don't want you to think that I've got the big head or something like that. I consider teaching God's Word boldly and truthfully more important at this moment because there's not all that many people doing it, letting the chips fall where they might. So I, I would rather be doing what I'm doing. I think it's even more important because there is not one nation in power or a person at the head of it that God has not ordained, Romans chapter 13. He's in control, but he's sure got to, the laborers are few when it comes to laying the ax to the old log. We're out of time. I love you all. You know why? Because you enjoy studying our Father's Word. You're not a fair-weather Christian. You like to plow deep, and hey, I like to plow with you. We're brought to you by your tithes and your offerings. Very near the old end of the month, if we've helped teach you, then help us reach others. Won't you do that? The most important thing is this. Stay in His Word every day, and it's a beautiful day. You know why? Jesus is the living Word. Thank you for joining with us in today's study of God's Word. If you would like to hear today's message again on audio cassette, or if you would like to know some of the other deeper in-depth studies that Pastor Murray has covered, write for the free tape catalog. Write Shepherd's Chapel, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. That's Shepherd's Chapel, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. And don't forget to mention Tape Catalog. Shepherd's Chapel also has a monthly newsletter letting you know what's happening at the chapel. So if you would like to receive this monthly newsletter, write to Shepherd's Chapel, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Thank you for joining us. And join us again each Monday through Friday at this same time for Shepherd's Chapel.